For the first time in the last 20 years, America is not involved in an active war, for now. I began researching and writing this essay several years ago, but this topic is more relevant now than ever. I talk a lot about warfare on this channel, and although I plan to change that soon, I wanted to address it given the nature of the current state of geopolitical affairs. What I'm looking to examine in this essay is the purpose not only of these continued armed conflicts, but why is warfare still a relevant form of humanity's political endeavors? Why has the modern world not outgrown warfare as humanity's most brutal form of communication? Why is it that America seems to be in a nearly constant state of war? And can humanity ever truly obtain a lasting peace? According to a quote engraved on the wall of the Imperial War Museum in London, only the dead have seen the end of war. This quote is attributed to the Greek philosopher Plato, but maybe not. We'll come back to that. However horrible the atrocities of war are, any close study of history cannot deny that it is one of the leading forces for geopolitical change in human history. Even within civilized society where acts of violence are allowed only by the state to enforce their laws and orders, it is often violent acts that contribute to the forming and changing of laws. In the realm of global politics, wars and avoidance of wars are the primary catalyst for the formation of any international law that exists. In his seminal work, The Shield of Achilles, Columbia Law Professor Philip Bobbitt examines the wars that shaped humanity's history, with a particular focus on Western European history. He proposes that evolutions in warfare tie directly into the formation of states, as in nations and countries. And the evolution of political states are driven by these series of conflicts that result in peace treaties that nullify previous state structures and validate new forms of legitimized governments. Until the peace is eventually broken in a series of conflicts that result in a continued evolution of state structures and warfare in what Bobbitt calls an epical war. And the idea of an epical war is, is that a, a war that begins for whatever ordinary reason, uh, some resource, or territorial or ideological, or religious, or fear, greed, at some point implicates the constitutional order itself, that its legitimacy is challenged. And that kind of a war will not stop until the order has either been validated or overturned by a more strategically dynamic order. And when that happens, then the entire national order changes as other states begin to mimic the successful state. More on that soon. Before we dive deeper into the history of warfare and statehood, I would like to step back and examine warfare and statecraft as if it were a game. Now, before anybody scoffs at the notion that violence is no game, as in an activity that one derives pleasure from, let me assure you, as a combat veteran myself, I fully understand and have great respect for the sacrifices and atrocities that war brings on any people. However, I'm not talking about game as in a form of amusement. I am instead talking about game as in game theory. Game theory is a complex subject of mathematics that is extremely useful in strategy. It is a high-level educational course taught in universities, but you don't need an advanced math degree to understand the principles of game theory. In fact, having a basic understanding of game theory is extremely useful to anybody involved in business, negotiation, or politics. Simon Sinek is a business-oriented motivational speaker and author of The Infinite Game, which teaches the underlying principles of game theory to business leaders and executives at all levels. Using mostly examples from high-level corporations such as Apple, Microsoft, American Airlines, and the Container Store, his pitch is for businesses to act with infinite mindsets as opposed to finite mindsets, and that is at the heart of what game theory is. In game theory, there are finite games, which consist of known players, fixed rules, and agreed-upon objectives that once reached end the game decisively. Soccer, baseball, chess have all of these elements. There are often clear winners in these games, although ties and stalemates are possible as they are governed by the rules laid out and agreed upon before the outset of the game. There are also infinite games, 
which have known and unknown players. No agreed upon rules, and no end, for they are infinite. There is no way to win an infinite game. The best you can do is just stay in the game. There is no winning in things like leadership, friendship, marriage, or business. Businesses may be successful, like Amazon, which is the current highest earning business in the world. But if it were to go bankrupt tomorrow, they would be out of the game. And another online retail company will take over. Sinek is speaking to business leaders who are trying to avoid that very thing. Staying in business and staying in the game. Because there cannot be a winner and a loser. There are no winners and losers in an infinite game. Right? It doesn't exist. And because there are no winners or losers, what ends up happening in the infinite contest is players drop out when they run out of the will or the resources to play. But there's no winners or losers. And just as Sinek is out there trying to compel business leaders to think of themselves as infinite, then certainly states, as in countries and nations, are playing infinite games on global scales. The main goal of a nation is to continue to protect and provide for its people within its borders. The most important way to accomplish this is simply to continue to exist. The history of world politics is an infinite game, as in a game that will go on long after there are people to play it and businesses can certainly outlast a person's energy. So too should not only politicians and world leaders, but citizens of the nation themselves understand the infinite goals of their nations. The funny thing about business is the number of companies that are playing finite. They're playing to win. They're playing to be the best. They're playing to beat the quarter or the year. And they're always frustrated by that company that has an amazing vision, a long-term vision that seems to drive them crazy. And over the long term, that player will always win, and the other player will run out of resources or the will, and they'll either go out of business or be bought or sold or merged or acquired or whatever it is. A politician who runs for office is often seeking the finite goal of winning the election, but politics as a whole is an infinite game. And too often politicians use finite-minded goals to gain traction in the political sphere. An example of this, and probably the most misunderstood metric in American national politics, is the national debt. Every person in the U.S. has a concept of debt, and many of us go into debt through mortgages or loans to pay for cars, houses, college tuition, or other high-priced luxury items. To the individual they see being in debt as a financial liability, this is because individuals can only afford to repay their debts by receiving income from a job. And humans can only work productively for so long and eventually we will have to die and that debt could be a burden on our families. We humans are finite creatures and we can only work efficiently in the national economy for a limited amount of time. But the nation is not a finite entity. Now is not the time to worry about the national debt. Actually, running budget deficits is a good thing. Debt is not something that the general public should be worried about for the time being. Like a business, it is infinite. Businesses and nations play the infinite game. Amazon, an example of a business, often operates with long-term debt. 50 billion as of 2021. However, Amazon at that same time has over $300 billion in assets with a very low debt ratio. Politicians often use the framing that the national debt will be left to our children to pay off around election time, playing into the finite-minded voter. There will be a day of reckoning, a debt crisis, and it won't be pretty. How long do you think your family would last if every month you spent more and more on the credit card and made the minimum payment. You owe the United States government, in round numbers, $50,000. <laughs> the politicians know better, or at least I would like to think they do. You belong to a party that has greenlit a historic expansion of deficits and debt. They know the country has continuous revenue streams from taxes and tariffs usually measured in the gross domestic product. You notice that none of these politicians ever cry foul over the growing national debt or pass legislation to decrease it once they were actually in office, proving that this was not the doomed issue that they were pretending it was. Do I wish that it was a higher priority for the president to rein in spending in the debt? Yes. Do you think your colleagues, the Republican Party, will rediscover its concern about oh, debt sure. and deficits? Sure. 
I mean, isn't that the most cynical, phony thing? Oh, look, thing? There, there's an isn't element that, that of it. Doesn't make you want to puke? You're touching into something that, as you know, I have raged. This chart showing debt, it's not just about the $30 trillion of debt. This is about tyranny. In his seminal work, The Shield of Achilles, Philip Bobbitt retraces the origins of Western governments as they are formed through cycles of conflicts and resolutions. Through warfare, states not only proliferate advancements in military technology and strategy, but also political strategies and government structures. The result is what Bobbitt calls an apocal cycle. Best example of this comes, of course, from art. The Shield of Achilles, from which Bobbitt named his book, is from Homer's epic poem, The Iliad. The Greek hero Achilles carries into battle a shield that was crafted by the gods. It was a piece of armor without peer, which gave Achilles an advantage over the enemy, until the armor was lost when the Greek Patroclus took Achilles' shield into battle against the Trojan hero Hector. Achilles would seek a replacement from the gods, but Hector the Trojan hero now had a shield of equal quality. And just like the shield was stolen from Achilles and used against him, all manner of military technology and political strategy can and will be adopted by your enemies in war. And the shield is depicted in the Iliad as having not only scenes of battle, but also uh, religious ceremonies, uh, law courts, uh, feasts and festivals. It, it integrates war with the larger culture. And that was one of the themes I wanted to reflect. Bobbitt traces the beginnings of the Apocal Cycle starting in the 14th century, when the introduction of mobile artillery during the Renaissance brought about what he calls the princely states, which established permanent governments with the Peace of Asburg in 1555. Following that, the gunpowder revolution and the adoption of standing armies created the kingly states, which was solidified with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. Those standing armies then turned into more professional armies that operated more like businesses, led to the creation of the territorial states that dominated trade markets and established aristocratic control. This was codified in the Treaty of Utrecht 1713. Following that, the French Revolution toppled the monarchy, previously legitimized government, and brought about the Napoleonic Revolution in tactical and strategic affairs, leading to the state nation, which was established in the Congress of Vienna, 1815. Advancements in communication aided by the Industrial Revolution led to the increased spread of ideology, as well as nationalism, that became the hallmark of the nation-state under the Treaty of Versailles, 1919. Apocalypse Wars naturally forced the state to innovate, either strategically or constitutionally, and successful innovations are easily copied by competing states. This answers our first question. America's nearly infinite state of global conflict over the last century is, according to Bobbitt's thesis, the long war, just one long war. That war started in 1914 and didn't end until 1990, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Long War is one in a series of apocal wars that takes place over long periods of times and contains several prolonged and smaller conflicts. When these epochs reach their zenith, there is a treaty that codifies the new constitutional order. The Long War codified the nation-state. The nation-state is written into international law in the Treaty of Versailles, and was cemented there with the end of the Second World War. Its purpose, beyond protecting borders, was to better the welfare of the nation. What became the Long War of the 20th century was about the constitutional valence of that new order. Would the industrial nation-state be a fascist state, a communist state, or a parliamentary state. And until that question was answered, these wars would not cease. They would keep, keep popping up. Sinek touches on this, on his speech about war as an infinite game, specifically speaking on the Cold War that followed World War II. The Cold War was stable. 
And that's because in an infinite game, there are no winners and losers. We cannot lose the game. And so we work to keep the game in play, right? In fact, Sinek in The Infinite Game suggests the following guide to help leaders engage in infinite-minded decision-making. I'm going to go through each one and also give analogies to the U.S. Cold War as examples of how these apply to statecraft. Advance a just cause. Great organizations understand their just cause, a cause so just that people would be willing to sacrifice to see the advancement of that cause. In explaining what a just cause is for a business, Sinek points to the Declaration of Independence. Our founding fathers declared, literally wrote down, they declared why we needed our own country. All men are created equal endowed with these unalienable rights, amongst which include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They were never against Britain. The whole point is not to be against something, but to stand for something. As a just cause, we can see that America's future constitutional laws are all based on this very premise. During the Cold War, America took it upon itself to encourage other nations to form governments in the model of Western parliamentary democracy and engage in free market capitalism. If you consider how the Cold War existed, it really existed on three tensions. There was a nuclear tension. Both, uh, both uh, states had nuclear weapons to end all life. There was an ideological tension. One was an exporter of democracy and capitalism. The other one is an exporter of Soviet-style communism. And there was an economic tension. That's what kept the Cold War alive and well. Not coincidentally, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The only three things for which we will bear any burden and pay any price and fight forever to defend. This is also where we link these two ideas between Bobbitt and Sinek. America in the Cold War fought to institutionalize that the nation state betters the population by providing life through equality liberty through democracy, and the pursuit of happiness through free market capitalism. At times, it would also favor regimes of authoritarians who were friendly to the West, but the overall premise was to advance the just cause of establishing both freedom of populations to choose their own leaders, as well as the flow of free capital among businesses and the global economy. Building trust. Humans are social creatures, and we work best in groups when trust is established. Trust is a currency of the government and the global economy. Trust in our financial systems is what gives currency its value. And trust in the government as a highly functioning administrative state is what continues to support laws and create order in our world. In the outgoing address to the nation he founded, George Washington warned of entangling alliances, drawing America into wars across Europe. However, at the time, Washington was concerned with the preservation of his fragile nation. Today, America has a network of alliances, treaties, and trade agreements that all hinge on trustworthiness. The strongest alliance in the West is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which comprises mostly of the allies that came out of World War II to stand against the continued threat of the imperial ambitions of the Soviet Union. Study your worthy rivals. There are always rivals in games, in finite games, in sports, in politics, and even in infinite games, such as politics and statecraft. Your rivals should drive you to perform better, to stay on the cutting edge of technology and keep abreast of changes to the game. Although ideologically opposed in many ways, the United States and the Soviet Union, each attributed to changes in technological fields that yielded advances in computing, communication, rocket technology. The most famous form of this was the space race that started with the Soviet Union's communication device. The space race drove both nations to be competitive with each other, to advance themselves. Prepare for existential flexibility, adapting both to changing information and changes in the game. Continuing with the space race, after the Soviet Union flaunted their superior rocket technology, America was right behind them. But the perception was that America was constantly coming in second place. The Soviet Union was the first to launch a satellite into space, 
then a man into space, then a man into orbit. National Aeronautics and Space Administration to discuss not just why we are losing the space race, but perhaps if it has already been lost. So the United States had to change the game in order to gain an advantage. They did so by upping the ante. You can put a man on the moon before the Russians. How about that? Ask if there's anything we can do for less of the taxpayers' dollars. What if we put up a space laboratory of some kind? They'll beat us. If we get into a race with them over heavy lifting capabilities, which is all that putting up a space station will demonstrate, we're going to lose for at least the next five years. Demonstrate the courage to be. Playing the infinite game sometimes means making sacrifices in the short term and going against Colin knowledge, which takes considerable courage. The height of the Cold War, the two nations were poised to possibly unleash nuclear war that would devastate not only both nations, but likely the whole planet, in what is referred to as mutually assured destruction. The closest the world came to this nightmare was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So what are the Soviets going to do when we attack? Nothing. Nothing, because the only alternative open to them is one they can't choose. I mean, how would we respond? If they killed ours, no, they're gonna do something, General, I can promise you that. Both nations were peering into finite nature of nuclear war, and both found the courage to make concessions that would allow each to continue to play the game. If you remove the missiles, then there will be no war. If the Soviet Union halts construction immediately, removes the missiles, and submits to UN inspection, the United States will pledge to never invade Cuba or aid others in that enterprise. If your Jupiter missiles in Turkey were removed also. Well, there can be no quid pro quo on this issue. The United States can offer a private assurance. Of course, any public disclosure of this assurance would negate the deal. The Cold War between the Allies and the Soviets played out in these smaller proxy nations, usually through diplomatic influence and occasional spycraft. Each constitutional order tried to spread their legitimate board of governance and commerce to other developing nations. I was under the impression that Dr. Ibanez supported a democracy. I'm afraid he's changed his mind. What's International Department of Central Committee members Trubnikov, Kershalnikov, who have become overly interested in their natural resources, particularly coffee. Think of the dangers of a Soviet presence so close to home. Our economic interests are being compromised. At times, America became obsessed with winning over states by trying to democratize by force. However, like in Vietnam, these were political problems which call for diplomatic solutions. Problems arise when you pit a finite player versus an infinite player. Because when a finite player is playing to win, and an infinite player is to playing to keep the game going, right? This is what happened to us in Vietnam. We were playing to win, and the Vietnamese were fighting for their lives. We were the ones who got stuck in quagmire. This is where the finite-minded thinking of military commanders were on full display. With no mind for political or infinite games, military commanders and the U.S. presidents only wanted victories. They wanted kill counts, battles won, American flags on mountaintops. And Joker, where's the weenie? Sir? The kill, Joker, the kill. I mean, all that fire, the grunts must have hit something. Didn't see him. I'll rewrite it and give it a happy ending. Say, uh, one kill. Make it a sapper or an officer. An officer? How about a general? <laughs> Joker, in case you didn't know it, this is not a particularly popular war. Now, it is our job to report the news that these, uh, why are we here, civilian newsmen ignore. The United States and the Soviet Union would both take advantage of the others missteps into finite-minded quagmire. And the president asked him, what is the policy of the United States in Afghanistan? And Brzezinski said, the policy of the United States is to eject the Soviet. It's a finite goal. And then almost as an offhanded comment, he says, and if we can't do that, we'll make it as expensive as possible for them to stay. In other words, the United States accidentally had an infinite strategy, which is not fixed in time and we don't know exactly what it looks like. What we're trying to do is drain the enemy of will and the resources to continue to play. Well, how does he expect to defeat the Soviets in Afghanistan? Well, well he wants to bleed them. Pay back for Vietnam, make it so they just have to keep sending troops in and keep sending money and troops and money until they just go out of their fucking minds the way we did. 
They need to shoot down the helicopters, Gus. It's gonna cost a lot more than ten million dollars. I say, for the fourth time, I can raise the money. How? A Soviet chopper or a plane falls out of the sky. Now, Russian MiGs go for $20 million. Stingers go for 60, 70,000. What do you want to do? Well, I'd like to double the 250 million. Remind me again, where did this thing start? Five million. And 10 years later, the Soviets drove their tanks out of Afghanistan, running out of resources and the will. But the Cold War eventually ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And to our mistake, America assumed it had won, but as Sanek points out, there's no winning in an infinite game. You must continue to play because other people will enter the game. And the Berlin Wall came down and the United States made, again, one of the greatest, perhaps one of the greatest blunders, policy blunders of the 20th century. They announced that they had won the game. They had won the Cold War. No, they didn't. The player dropped out because they ran out of the will or the resources to play. And the problem is, is because they thought they had won the war, they started acting like victors. And the United States imposed their will on the world for about 11 years, and as it turns out, the world didn't like that too much. And as what happens in all infinite contests, new players started to emerge. And America was reminded of this with the terrorist attacks in 2001, which the US promptly took up as an opportunity to enter into conflicts around the world toward terrorists who were hiding in the hinterlands of underdeveloped countries, such as in Afghanistan, where supposedly Osama bin Laden had been operating when he oversaw the plan to execute the terrorist attacks in America. I'm a bin Laden. But this is clearly Al-Qaeda. I've been tracking their movements for years. Their fingerprints are all over this. Iraq has all the good targets. Iraq has nothing to do with this time. Richard, you don't know that for I sure. I do know that. Mr. President, if I may, Afghanistan is Al-Qaeda's headquarters. That is where our focus should be. The global war on terror, as it came to be called, included the more ambitious and less politically thought out objective of invading and occupying the nation of Iraq. Through more rational and less emotional reflection on the war on terror, America could have seen terrorism simply as a product of the fading hegemonic constitutional orders. Philip Bobbitt addressed this in his follow-up book, The Shield of Achilles and Terror and Consent. The following military campaigns of the war on terror were waged in the name of restoring world order, became just more short-sighted military operations that resulted in thousands of U.S. military casualties and hundreds of thousands of civilian casualties in the nations where they were fought. As Neck explains, it's important for infinite organizations to act in reasonable and predictable ways to promote an environment of trust. Human beings are social animals and we respond to the environments we're in and ultimately it is the leadership that is responsible for setting the environment. Get the environment right, you get trusting teams. Get the environment wrong, you are forcing people to protect themselves from you. It is a sign that they feel that they have to take time and energy away from advancing the just cause in order to protect themselves from the organization. If they feel safe, all of their energy goes to advancing the just cause. Uh, just get an air bombardment in Iraq, I think it would make a statement. So we're done. I think they'll prosecute us. The war on terror was a low point for American hegemony on the world stage as our allies began to distrust America's leadership. And if there was any lesson learned from the war on terror, it is that it's much easier to start a war than to end one. And that's because military leaders are by nature finite minded. Military officers' careers are built upon achievements, so they are somewhat political games. Military officers always want to win a battle rather than engage in diplomacy. Beetle, I don't know anything about politics, you know that. I have no political ambitions after the war. All I want to do is to command an army in combat. Hold on my belly to get a command. For God's sake, you've got to get me in this fight. My God, Hitler's own people tried to kill him a couple of days ago. First thing you know, it'll all be over and... The war on terror was a flawed exercise from the outset, as Americans found that terrorists were non-state actors who did not hold territory to begin with, and their networks were already advanced enough to exist within the digital space. 
All personnel easily moved out of America's way whenever they came in. They, along with other terrorist and extremist political movements, took opportunities to move into places like Iraq and Afghanistan to engage American military in a never-ending conflict to try and drain America of its will and resources in the region. We see this in a bizarre but surprisingly accurate depiction of Stanley McChrystal's short-lived command of U.S. forces in Afghanistan from June 2009 to June 2010. Given your reputation and your formidable drive, our hope is that you're the man who will get the job done. First things first, we want you to make an assessment of the situation here. Travel the country, talk to people. You'll tell us what needs to be done, how are you going to get it done, and what you need in order to get it done. But whatever it is, we want you to bring it on home, Glenn. But <coughs> whatever you do, please do not ask the president for more troops. <coughs> no more troops, Glenn. Who, even in his understanding that the war was not going well, he still believes that he could eke out a perceived win by controlling a particular province within Afghanistan, even though... If I was you, I'd, I'd, I'd concentrate on those parts of the country that are at least in some way sympathetic to the mission. This whole province constitutes just 4% of the population of the country. I want to take Helmand province. I want to take Helmand province precisely because everyone else seems to think we can't have it. We're going to win the trust of this country. We can't be seen to accept that there's a whole chunk of it we can't handle. 40,000. I'm afraid so. God damn it, Glenn. What do we tell you? No more troops. Don't ask for more troops. What do you do? You ask for 40,000 more troops. Well, Dick, Helmand province ain't exactly about to secure itself. The crystal is not alone in this thinking. Uh, you'll recall that all military generals also tried to convince President Biden to continue the 20-year-long engagement. That is because military leaders are rewarded for achievements. And without war, there is no opportunity for achievements. Moral hazard can develop in militaries or any institution where finite thinkers are rewarded for their finite thinking. The 2015 film, The Big Short, based on a book by Michael Lewis, is a compelling account of the 2007 financial crisis on Wall Street and those that saw it coming and were able to make money off of it. No, no, no stocks. I want to, I want to short the housing market. But the housing market is rock solid. Mortgage-backed securities are filled with climate adjustable rate loans. And when the majority of the adjustable rate kick in in 07, they will begin to fail. And if they fail above 15%, the whole bond is worthless. Do you get a chance to look at what we sent you, Ben? Hold on. You scared the shit out of me. Payoff is like 25 to 1. Yeah. OK, so why are you calling me? I don't do this anymore. If we get a hunting license, we can short this crap. And we know you hit Wall Street. We're not asking you to do trading. We are simply asking, help us. Get us at the fucking table. It's a pretty ugly table, guys. Which demonstrates the finite and dangerous thinking of stock market financial investors. You smell that? What is that? What? What's that smell? The cologne? No. Opportunity. No, money. The film describes exactly how investment world only looks for money in short terms. The title, The Big Short, derives from the name of an investment that is designed to make money on a stock that is falling in value. Thousands of AAA mortgages bundled together, guaranteed by the U.S. government. Somewhere along the line, these B's and double B's went from a little risky to dog shit. I'm talking rock bottom FICO scores. No income verification. Adjustable rates, dog shit. Bees, zero. And then that happens. What is that? That's America's housing market. Ben, the payoff is 200 to one. But they're all taking the ratings at face value. So they're charging pennies on the dollar to bet against the double A's. Just when I started thinking you guys are clowns, no one on the planet is betting against double-A. The banks will think we're either high or having a stroke, and they'll take every dime we have to offer. They're literally making money on destruction of business. If we're right, if we're right, people lose homes, 
People lose jobs. People lose retirement savings. People lose pensions. You know what I hate about fucking banking? It reduces people to numbers. Here's a number. Every 1% unemployment goes up. 40,000 people die. Did you know that? No. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. This is the problem, however, when the businesses that are being bet against are too big to fail, a term coined during the same crisis for the risk to the mortgage industry in America. That's in the resilience of the financial system. Thank you all. <laughs> Doubt's falling off a cliff. 400 points already, the credit markets are frozen. Goldman and Morgan Stanley are getting slammed by withdrawals. Wall Street started bundling home loans together, mortgage-backed securities, and selling slices of those bundles to investors. And they were making big money. The lenders had already given loans to borrowers with good credit, so they go bottom feeding, they lower their criteria. And the buyer, the regular guy on the street, assumes that the experts know what they're doing. So he reaches for the American dream. He buys that house. The banks knew securities based on shitbag mortgages were risky. The banks started buying a kind of insurance. If mortgages default, insurance company pays. Default swap. The banks insure their potential losses to move the risk off their books so they can invest more make more money. Then the unexpected happens. Housing prices go down. Poor bastard who bought his dream house. He defaults. Mortgage-backed securities tank. AIG has to pay off the swaps. Every bank they insure books massive losses on the same day. And then they all go under. It all comes down. The whole financial system? And what do I say when they ask me why it wasn't regulated? They were making too much money. American government being the infinite thinker, had to step in to avert disaster. I spent my entire academic career studying the Great Depression. The Depression may have started because of a stock market crash, but what hit the general economy was a disruption of credit. Average citizens unable to borrow money, to do anything, to buy a home, start a business, stock their shelves. Credit has the ability to build a modern economy, but lack of credit has the power to destroy it swiftly and absolutely. If we do not act boldly and immediately, we will replay the depression of the 1930s. Only this time, it will be far, far worse. They pumped billions of taxpayer dollars into these banks to ensure that the mortgage companies would not default. However, this also enriched the very investors that created the crisis. Lehman Wall Street has a gambling problem. The government keeps covering their losses. They never learn anything. What? I didn't know if you wanted to keep lecturing me on moral hazard or if I should just call And thus, the practices that led to the financial crisis are still incentivized as legitimate ways to make money. And according to game theory, if there's little risk to this game, then the practices will continue, which itself is a moral hazard. The American government knew there's no folding and walking away like the investors who made millions during the crisis did. They just folded up their businesses. Businesses can go bankrupt and CEOs can walk away with all the profits that are left over. They can even go on and start new ventures, but the government cannot afford this as nations are too big to fail and must continue to maintain the will and the resources to stay in the game. The business leaders that Sinek is often speaking to in The Infinite Game do want to see their companies become the next Apple, Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, or Disney. He wants the finite-minded businessmen to see companies as playing in infinite games, thinking about doing what is needed to stay in business long term. What it would suggest for everyday citizens is to start thinking of the nation in global terms, in the infinite mindset. Moral hazard also exists in the U.S. military command. Returning to the example of Stanley McChrystal, and his short tenure as commander of forces in Afghanistan. Introduce you to Sean Cullen here. Sean's the writer from Rolling Stone. He's been doing that profile piece on you. Rolling Stone. Yes, sir. Just make sure I'm on the cover. What? In the end, he was not held accountable for failure to achieve strategic victories. That Rolling Stone article came out, and it's not good. Sir, it says we're shit-talking our president. We hammer the whole world on, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Really? It's no, we can't. He sold us on like a double negative. Not really, but I know what you mean. And our vice president. 
We don't have the support of our coalition partners. Why are you sending boys to Nauzad and Musakala? I mean, there's nothing out there. I'm just not quite clear what it is you're trying to control there. Now we're drunk all over Europe. As long as military commanders are continuously rewarded for strategic tactical victories rather than political victories. What are you writing? I'm a writer. This moral hazard will continue. I write. I better like what it is you're writing. Remember that Bob had concluded that Palkal's war that supported the nation-state was over and concluded with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Peace of Paris in 1990 which means that the global war on terror was all part of the next apocalypse cycle with a new constitutional order to be born of that conflict. And that constitutional order is what's called the market state. The previous nation state dictated that government interventions and regulate the free market to ensure the welfare of the nations as we did in the 2007 financial crisis. The global economy is a feature the market state must deal with. The market state maintains its legitimacy by maximizing opportunity for its citizens. So let's go back to the very end of the nation state and the birth of this market state and the new apocalypse war that we are in. Forgetting about the global war on terror for a minute, going back to 1991. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the West took a limited interest in conflicts around the world. The U.S. government developed distinct procedures for entering into conflicts in what is called the Powell Doctrine which is employed by the George Herbert Walker Bush administration to determine if a military intervention in Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1990 would be strategically practical and tactically possible. This will not stand this aggression against uh, Kuwait. The relative speed, success, and low casualties in that conflict seem to imply that America had found its role to play as the leader in this new apocalypse cycle. I was able to guarantee President Bush that we would succeed because the Iraqi army was sitting there in Kuwait like a golf ball on top of the tee waiting to be hit. Fresh out of the quagmires of the Cold War, with images of Vietnam still haunting the American psyche, the Bush administration was reluctant at first to get involved in the Middle Eastern conflict when the oil-rich and Western-friendly nation of Kuwait was invaded by a neighboring Iraq. Colin Powell, then head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, developed what became known as the Powell Doctrine which was an expansion on the Weinberg Doctrine. And Powell believed, based on the Vietnam experience, that if the United States goes to war, it has to have a clear military objective. Down the road, that's what I want to accomplish. I want to put the number of troops in that can take care of that problem. I want to have popular support, and I want to have an exit strategy. I want to go in, I want to accomplish it, and I want to get out. In other words, the purpose of the Powell Doctrine was to establish a clear military finite objective that was in line with America's overall policy aims for their infinite objective. The Powell Doctrine features six questions. One, is the political objective we seek important, clearly defined, and understood? Two, have all other nonviolent means failed? Three. Will the military force achieve the objective? Four, at what cost? Five, have the gains and risks been analyzed? And six, how might the situation we seek to alter, once altered by force, develop further, and what might be the consequences? These questions are rather long-winded, so I simplified them to one, is the objective important? Two, has diplomacy failed? Three, is the objective achievable? Four, at what cost? Five, is it worth the risk? And six, what happens next? These are the exact doctrine that the American government under the George Bush Jr. administration threw out the window. Invasion of Iraq is at 53%. And uh, France and Germany have both said that they will not join our coalition, and neither will Israel. They said an invasion of Iraq would destabilize the region, sir, and they, they don't believe Saddam is an immediate threat. Harry Powell has the highest trustworthy ratings of all of us. What if he gave an address to the UN and the American people? Carl, I have been very vocal, very vocal about my reservations about evading Iraq. No, Colin, you're such a nervous Nelly. And as the fates would have it, it was General Colin Powell's own words that convinced the world to be complicit in allowing the U.S. to invade and occupy Iraq. 
surprise to any of us. Terrorism has been a tool used by Saddam for decades. Saddam was a supporter of terrorism long before these terrorist networks had a name. By the way, that conflict would eventually result in quagmire. These were the very situations which the Powell Doctrine was trying to avoid. Although I believe if the Bush administration had adhered to the Powell Doctrine, we could have avoided quagmire, I do not believe the Powell Doctrine is without fault. All the questions are rather subjective. There's no clear, definitive markation for finding things like broad support among the population for an armed conflict. Oh, remember that quote from the Imperial War Museum in London? There's no record that Plato ever said or wrote that. The wall was engraved in 1936. General Douglas MacArthur also attributed that quote to Plato in a farewell address to West Point in 1962. A Vietnam veteran used that quote in a book in 2003, and Ridley Scott even used it in the 2001 film Black Hawk Down. The quote was actually first published in Soliloquies in England and later Soliloquies in 1922. Plato died in 284 BCE. The information revolution of the Long War are continuing to advance in dramatic fashion in the wars of the market state. It's not only just cyber warfare and hacking. Any server, any connection, the modern battlefield is everywhere. But also control and dissemination of information across social media that will impact future wars, congressional orders, and the market state. It's already here. We're already fighting and losing the control of information. Authoritative regimes, unlike congressional states, wield nearly total control over both public and social media, as opposed to Western parliamentary democracies, where rights and freedom of speech and press are at the foundation of our values, the very thing we would fight an infinite war to protect. You can already see where battle lines in the future will eventually be drawn. Wars may be fought with nation's youth in the form of soldiers, but wars are won by national economies. Left-leaning parliamentary democracies of previous nations tend to favor free market capitalism. Capitalism has served these states well through the post-war and Cold War era, while authoritative governments tend to favor oligarchies with a unique take on capitalism, which is state-controlled capital markets, which has been perfected in China. Last month, from Russia, they dump hundreds of billions of Fannie and Freddie's bonds onto the market. The market will stabilize. We just have to give it some time. Even in the U.S., it seems the relationship between the government and private industry isn't so simple. If we take a look at the current polarization of global politics in terms of the Cold War, the infinite game then that America and its allies are continuing to promote is for the values of human rights, life, liberty in the form of democracy, and the pursuit of happiness in the form of a global network of free market capitalism. While other nations favor stricter control of their populations, life, they favor the rule of authoritative governments, tyranny, and the state controlled of economies. This is the infinite war we are in. These nations are betting in the future of the global economy will be so volatile that democracies will be at a disadvantage and they will not have ample time to reach a consensus of government of the people and that the authoritative governments will have the advantage of centralized leadership and complete control of the nation's access to information and money. So let's return to my questions. Why is warfare still a relevant form of humanity's political endeavors? Because war is a human mechanism for large-scale change in political systems and because governments need to continue to improve to meet the needs of the populations, and wars will continue to be fought on the margins of political discourse. Why is it that America seems to be in nearly constant state of war? America is the default leader of the pro-democracy capitalist world order, and there will always be challengers to this institution, whether they are non-state actors or nations. America counters these threats by expanding our network of allied nations with shared values of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. How can we endeavor to find peace? The reason behind the necessity of the nearly infinite state of war on the global stage is not born of aggression, but the preservation of our own values, which are social norms that we hold 
as necessary in maintaining our identity. But in the end, peace is just one of the many finite gains in an ongoing infinite war that is being waged on our values. This has been a production of Minimum Effort Media. There are new video essays here on the first Friday of every month. Please like, subscribe, and comment if you care to. You can also find me on social media at The Lacey Stoic. Thank you for watching.